recorded. And with that, we can begin. So hello, everyone. I'm Simone Azar, Director of Industry Affairs and Public Policy at Supply Chain Canada. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Economic Order Quantity from Theory to Practice, in partnership with Slimstock Canada. We're joined today by Danny Bloom, Supply Chain Consultant at Slimstock, as well as Pierre Berard, President at BGCT Consulting. I'm going to turn it over to Danny shortly, but just to remind everyone that this webinar is recorded. And if you are an SCMP uh, holder, the webinar is worth two CPD points. So please just take the time to enter your activity in the portal following the webinar. If you have any questions um, for our speakers, I just encourage you to you know, type them out in the chat box or in the Q&A. And uh, I think at the end of the session, we'll go through, through those questions. Um, so with that, I'll just turn it over to you, Danny. Thank you, Simona. Uh, thanks for introducing us and thanks to Supply Chain Canada for putting this together. Um, so yeah, today we're gonna talk about the um, implementation of uh, EOQs or economic order quantities. Um, here with me, I have Pierre Berlin, who uh, we've been working together with a lot, um, actually uh, facilitating and, and running EOQ implementations in uh, supply chains. Um, and today we wanna to take you through uh, one of our, our sort of roadmaps and, and uh, practical tips and tricks to, uh, to make this happen. So we have three main focus areas for today's webinar. Um, we're gonna start with um, a light background on what the EOQ is and what its purpose is, uh, just to make sure everyone has the same baseline understanding of the, the economic order quantity. Uh, we're gonna talk about optimizing results. Um, a very important aspect is in EOQs is talking about the, the actual input parameters other than the, the output parameter, which is the economic order quantity. And we're gonna talk about a, a roadmap to a full application of the EOQ in, in your business or uh, you know, the experience we, we have with that. So um, we're gonna start with some introductions. Um, I'll start with myself. So my name is Danny Bloom. I'm a senior consultant at Slimstock uh, Canada. Um, in my career, I am currently responsible for onboarding new customers or new business onto our uh, demand and supply planning platform uh, called Slim4. Uh, and I work, I work over a lot of sort of projects that not only the onboarding, but also, you know, aftermarket projects like, like implementing economic order quantities, um, not only the theory, but actually making it work. Um, that's where we're going to show you today. There's, there's lots of ifs and buts when, when you're implementing EOQs, and, and that's a big part of my job. Uh, with me, I have Pierre Berard. Um, I've been working with Pierre for a couple of years now, um, which has always been great. Um, he's got a lot of experience uh, doing, doing this as well. So Pierre, welcome. Um, would you mind introducing yourself uh, for a couple of seconds? No, it would be my pleasure. Pierre Berard, uh, responsible for the uh, deployment of Slimstock within Sun Park Canada right now. It's one of the uh, the main projects that uh, that we're doing. And I would say what I would say separate what we're offering from most is that for us, it's not about implementing something. It's about ensuring results. So we're basically spending a ton of time, not only uh, making sure that people can use the system, but making sure also that we're delivering sizable improvement for Sun Bar Canada. Mm -hmm. If you look in terms of background, I've been associated with some fairly large organization in the aerospace, telecom, and uh, I would say uh, automotive fields, and I would say several senior position. And about five years ago, uh, I've started my own consulting firm with former colleagues, and we're basically specializing in uh, project management and uh, continuous improvement. Thank you, Pierre. Um, so to continue, um, also give you a bit of a background, not only about the participants, but also about Slimstock. Um, as, as some of you might know, uh, but some of you might not know, uh, Slimstock is a, a global provider of demand and supply planning uh, software and services. Uh, we have about a over a thousand customers globally. Uh, we run 130 plus implementation projects across, across the globe every year. Um, we're active in about 50 countries and we have offices uh, up in 26. Um, 
So what we do, you know, I think our, our focus is always inventory optimization, of which the EOQ is is actually a, a very big part. Uh, and it's all about getting the right stock into the right place um, at the right time. Um, and we do that with modules that cater to uh, forecasting, inventory management, uh, assortment management, uh, promotion, shelf life, SNOP, product lifecycle management, and uh, of course, order optimization. Uh, the EOQ is a big part of that, as I said before. So today we wanna wanna talk you through uh, what the EOQ is, how to, to uh, get to your, your input parameters and how to actually roll it out in your business. So um, I'm gonna start with the um, background um, about the economic order quantity. So the economic order quantity is, it's a very old, um, it's a very old formula. I think it's over, over a hundred years old. Um, I actually don't remember the name of the guy who, who invented it. Um, and basically what it tries to do, it's a, it's a trade-off formula and it tries to find an optimal order quantity in this case. And that order quantity could be something you're buying from your vendor, something you're producing on a production line or the optimal quantity you're transferring between locations. So in like a hub and spoke environment. So it balances basically two things. On one hand, we have the ordering cost. So how much does it cost you to place an order, which is a, an, an amount we, we express in, in there's or, or currency you're working in or it's the holding cost. So the holding costs are a percentage of the, the price that you're buying or, or holding inventory against. That could be a landed average, could be the actual buying price. And the cost of hold will take you to actually store that in a warehouse uh, up to a year. So it tries to balance these costs and then really find the, the quantity that's gonna be cheapest for you to actually be, uh, be, be buying and holding at the same time. Uh, assuming that you're you're actually keeping that 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 product in inventory for a certain amount of time, so um, it's all about balancing these these two costs. Um, and if we look at the actual formula, uh, as I explained earlier, it consists of our holding costs, which is uh, basically the amount you're ordering um, divided by two. Uh, times the purchasing price, uh, times the cost of a product per year. So let's say if you, you know, you have a product that you buy two of them, your demand is zero, and that means we're actually holding two in inventory for at least a year. That's going to be the cost of that might be expressed as a percentage of 20%. So the cost of holding inventory would be 20% in that case, or 20 cents throughout the year if the product price is a dollar. On the other hand, we have our ordering cost. So um, our ordering costs are the price of actually placing an order. So there's a lot of things that actually go into an order cost. Uh, more about that later. Uh, but basically, we're looking for a cost in, in dollars or another currency where we say, okay, we, we um, the, the more often we buy in a year, the higher my ordering costs are going to be. So that means that the more you order at once, the lower they're going to be. So if you buy 10 times a year and it costs you $20 each time you order, the order cost will be uh, $200. Whereas if you order only once, it's gonna be 20 bucks. Uh, but you're gonna be buying a lot more, which would increase your holding costs on the other hand. Now, what they found is, and that's where the trade-off comes in, the, 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 the moment or the point where the amount you're buying, and we balance the holding and ordering cost perfectly, that's that's uh, also where the holding and order cost intersect. And that's where you find your economic order quantity. So at that point, the sum of my order cost and my holding costs are gonna be at its absolute lowest. And that's what we call the EOQ. So it could be that you're finding an EOQ, which is 200, that means that uh, you best buy 200 units of a product every time you place an order um, and that reflects the total, the lowest total cost of ownership for, for an item. So um, Pierre, maybe to get started, the, um, the EOQ, um, I always find that it's, um, it's a great formula. Um, but what, if, what I've heard and experienced from, from implementing, uh, you know, you put in the input parameters and you get a result and people tell me, well, the result is wrong. Um, I always say, no, the result is never wrong. The formula is, it's hard to attack the formula because it's, it's a simple trade-off formula, it's, it's correct. 
uh, but we see a lot of issues with the the actual input parameters. What's uh, what's your experience with um, the EOQ and and how to actually apply it in businesses? And, and what have you seen in your uh, past career trying to use this uh, formula? Yeah, I would say that the reason why people are saying it's wrong is because they always look at I would say price okay versus volume and they're gonna say okay we cannot buy three bolts it doesn't any it doesn't make any sense mm -hmm. okay. and the trade-off on the other side is that buying a pallet would, would be cheaper for the the logistic guys mm -hmm. okay it make much sense okay when you look at how long you're gonna carry inventory mm -hmm. other reason for that is that it's not true that all SKUs are the same mm -hmm. so depending on size depending on Okay, for us in our world, uh, obsolescence is a big one. Mm -hmm. so when you look at A, B item, it's not such a big deal, but very often we would like to cap when we get to B, any item or slow and irregular uh, demand type items. Mm -hmm. uh, we'd like to cap because the issue with EOQ is that yes, it makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. when you look at the value to buy larger quantity, but the larger quantity may represent two, three years of stock. Mm -hmm. and End of the day on those items, you end up throwing them in the garbage, uh, looking at them as obsolescence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the idea is to be a bit smart. The one size fits all, I would say, mm -hmm. formula is probably a good starting point. Mm -hmm. But I would say you have to adapt EOQ to the size of the product, you have to adapt mm -hmm. EOQ to the velocity of mm -hmm. the product. So there's multiple dimensions yeah. that can be taken into account if you really want to optimize. Yeah. So when they're saying, okay, it doesn't make sense, I think sometimes or most of the time they're right, but it's because they didn't really uh, aggregate and subgroup, okay, the SKUs mm -hmm. that got, and that's the reason why it doesn't make sense. Yeah, so basically what you're saying, we, we, um, we cannot just assume, and but what I like that you're saying is it's, we cannot assume that the holding costs are equal for every product that we have. Uh, there's there's um, okay. there's different different um, different elements that affect different SKUs in, in different ways, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit more detail. On the other hand, we we also have stakeholders in the in the rest of our business um, where you know. The adoption of the the logistics and the warehousing team. So EOQ is is as as, as um, you know, but maybe for for the rest of the attendees, it's often used in supply chain planning exercises. So that's means it's a tool used by the, the buying the team that does the actual purchasing, the team that does the actual inventory planning. Um, but often the people who are actually handling the product, um, they're going to get some. They're going to get some straight uh, strange um, strange results if you're just applying the EOQ as is. Um, I think, you know, you can all imagine, and you might have all seen this in practice, if we uh, get an economic order quantity, and let's say it's 761, and someone in the warehouse goes and pick 761, uh, or they have to receive 761, and it's going to be, you know, one and a half pallets, two boxes, and three single items, um, there's, there's somebody going to look up at, at the, the people in the office doing that and they're going to be like okay what 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 are they doing why can't we just order another extra full box or just make it two pallets it's it's a lot easier to handle uh from here and these are these are also costs that are really hard to capture in the eoq formula so we, we have to take that into account as we uh, go through it and we've got a couple of more slides um so kind of want to take it a little bit more in depth if you care um so basically, if we look at the EOQ formula here, we have three very important input parameters. So we have the holding cost, the order cost, but we also have the yearly demand. And that's actually often overlooked. Everyone talks about the holding and order cost, but what is your yearly demand? What is the yearly demand you're using? So I kind of want to start uh, looking at those three individually and, and um, share some experience about what's going to be the best one with what is yearly demand? What are holding costs? How do we build them up? And what about um, our, our um, order costs? So um, if we look at uh, the yearly demand being the first one. So typically in the EOQ, you sort of have 
a couple of options. So the first divide is we're going to look at our yearly demand as historical sales. The other one is we're going to look at a forecast um, to, to being different because the forecast has another layer of information in it that the history might not. Uh, history could be compromised by stockouts. It could be compromised by uh, maybe the product is actually trending. Uh, there's different different things that affect it. So, Pierre, from your experience, history or forecast, what what have you been working with, and you know what what are what are other things we have to think of when we model yearly demand as an input parameter? Yeah, I would say I would say forecast is basically what we use. Okay, mm -hmm. yearly demand is really backward looking. Mm -hmm. I would say if you don't have any forecasts, it's probably okay. But as soon as you have forecasts, and I would say mm -hmm. reliable forecasts. Yearly demand doesn't really look at trending or seasonality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Forecast and you play with the period. Okay, you can capture that. So for me, one makes more sense than the other one. And what we're suggesting to our customers to use forecast instead of uh, yearly demand. Yeah, and you know you're gonna see trending in there. So that seasonality. Um, as as you update your economic order quantity throughout the year. Um, you, you might change your economic order quantity varying or depending on whether you're moving into a high season or a low season. Um, and it makes sense to, to, to update that. And it will change your um, EOQ results um, from there. Uh, what I also, why I also actually like forecast is, um, you know, if you're having new products, uh, you might actually want to start entering those in that EOQ formula as well. Um, given their lack of history at that point it it might not work so if you work with forecast um but also uh, products that are end of life uh, that's that's all data that we model in a forecast but not not necessarily in history so i uh, would get a better result as um as a consequence of, of starting with the forecast um so if we have the holding cost pair um so i think there's this there's Two, two sort of main args of, of different costs that would re represent holding costs. We have the capital costs, uh, so the, the, the cost of investing money versus the non-capital costs, which are related to the actual storage of the, the product. What's your experience with actually acquiring holding costs? Because there's there's a lot of elements I see on this, this page here. Uh, so, you know, where, where do we get that data? What do we have to take into account when modeling? That, that's a good point because that's, I would say, one of the reasons why uh, people will use rule, rule of thumb or something like that, or mm -hmm. they it, but it's going to be across the site and it's going to be the same thing. Mm -hmm. That takes some effort to uh, basically get those numbers. But I would say it's worth spending the effort because then you remove, okay, the, the guessing game and mm -hmm. the tension between logistics and inventory management, mm -hmm. where one the, the largest possible size and the other one wants the smallest possible size because they have objectives that are conflicting. Mm -hmm. For me, it's worth doing it, but people need to understand that it takes a lot of effort. Okay? Mm -hmm. so the reason why I'm saying you need to basically segregate or identify major subgroups is that you don't want to go to the end decimal in terms of discrimination, mm -hmm. but you want to have enough okay, to be able to uh, Basically, I have EOQ working properly for you. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, basically, you know, you're saying is we uh, we can calculate a holding cost, but we we shouldn't be going, you know, twenty percent across the board for every product that we carry. Um, I would, start I would, by dividing maybe by product line, you can diversify those costs. So it could be fifteen percent for for right. bigger products, larger volumes, like physically bigger uh, versus fifteen percent for for smaller products that don't take up as much space. Yeah, and, and, and you need to go through some education also, because I remember for finance people, they were saying, okay, we're cash positive, we don't have any debt, so the cost of capital is minimal, okay? Mm -hmm. so yeah, your cost of capital is minimal, but when you have 10% of your inventory, which is obsolete, okay, mm -hmm. then there's something that you need to figure out. Yeah. And you say, how come we got to that point where at the end of the year, we have a few million dollars that we need to throw in the garbage? So the whole idea is to understand that a SKU is not a SKU, okay? They're different. Mm -hmm. But if you aggregate them in subgroup properly and you do the proper calculation, mm -hmm. there will be some, I would say, intelligence be behind the OQ. That yeah. will be very helpful. Yeah. You know, 
you look at cost of capital, I think at some point in time, it was very, very critical to give the interest rate and so on. Mm -hmm. But much more today, it's shifting on the right hand side. And I, I feel like, you know, there, there's often, especially in finance departments, they talk about interest rates. Um, but something you're overlooking uh, is also the, the actual opportunity cost. So mm -hmm. if I'm not, um, if I'm not holding this product here, that gives me another hundred thousand dollars to spend on another product, which I can then turn around and increase my margin. Because every time you sell a product, you earn margin. If it's on a shelf, uh, you're you're basically not not earning money. So I think opportunity cost is also something we've been that's historically been been overlooked by a lot of companies. Um, because you know, for the same amount of money, you can buy different products or you can open new locations. Um, it's basically, you know, cash sitting there uh, doing nothing. And if you don't model that in the EOQ, um, you're just basically injecting a lot of cash that's going to be sitting on the, on the shelf. And, and EOQ can play against you. Okay. Mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm going back to d &E item. You have to be super critical. And that's the reason why we're using CAP. Mm -hmm. Okay. Same thing for branch where you have a lead time between the CDC and the branch of about 48 hours. Mm -hmm. I would say using EOQ, okay, it doesn't make sense if you go beyond, I don't know, okay, something like four to eight weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, the straight EOQ calculation doesn't make a sense, doesn't make okay much sense, mm -hmm. especially if you use milk runs. Yeah, I think that that's partly well, what's really hard to model is that depreciation or obsolescence as you were talking about. Um, it's uh, it's not really a cost you can express in the percentage of the price. Um, just need to align everyone or everyone on on the call. So depreciation is basically the the cost of throwing a product away because you can't sell it anymore because no one wants to buy it. Um, and it's it's basically a percentage that you know in three months you might be able to to sell ninety percent of the inventory you have right now. But can you still sell it in two years? So if you're buying two years, there's a big chance that a large part of that order uh, or of that inventory is going to be have to thrown away. So everything beyond a year of supply, you could maybe model as you know, 50% will be thrown away. So it's a it's a sliding scale. Um, the more you buy, the more uh, you actually have to write off, and that's really hard to model as a in capture and capture in one percentage. Um, so that's something uh, you have to take into account. Now, another one we were talking about earlier, Pierre, is the actual, I think it ties into labor uh, and, and rent. Um, we have to diversify our cost by uh, probably geographic location because I'm, I'm here in the GTA. Mm -hmm. um, you might have a branch that's uh, maybe, you know, uh, remote Ontario. Um, where the cost of real estate are just a lot lower. So rents are lower, labor is cheaper. Um, so you, you also want to make that diversification, no? Well, yes, okay, geography is one of them. Okay, I would say also size of the SKUs. Okay, because mm -hmm. some have very low value SKUs, but the size is big. So yeah. it will be more expensive. It's going to capture more space. Yeah. Okay. In the warehouse, okay, you're not basically paying by pound, but you're paying by, I would say, square footage. So square footage or cubic foot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you look at that, you say size is another thing when you look yeah. at creating subgroups that you need to take that into account. And in our warehouse, we're using zones mm -hmm. to, to differentiate, okay, in terms of what are the different EUQ settings that you should have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that's uh, it plays a big role um, in, in capturing a, a, a good model. Uh, I think there was one other that we, uh, and, and partly it could be related to order costs as well, but you know, how do you actually store the product? Is it on a uh, big, big pallet uh, or are we storing it in, in small spaces? Um, and I think that ties back or ties into more, more into our order costs as well. Um, so if we want to look at the order and cost uh, components, um, how, how do you diversify here? How do you diversify? Or how, how do you calculate? How do you, um, you know, are we transportation? You know, we have setup costs, inbound costs, um, 
we talked about robotics in the warehouse, which I think will will um, change the the actual ordering cost as you know you automate your picking. Uh, your ordering costs are going to be lower to a certain extent, and now actually those costs flow into your your holding costs as you have have robots running there. So yeah, the the order costs are basically the cost for placing an order. Um, so it is, I think, you know, there, there's uh, some important elements here. Uh, we're basically looking at, you know, what, what is the price of a hiring a buyer uh, that does uh, that does this exercise? How um, how have you gone through actually determining ordering costs? Uh, same thing. Again, we look at the different dimension. Okay, we use our financials. Mm -hmm. Okay, financial people, by the way. Okay, to look at uh, our, I would say, average, okay, cost on different dimension, okay, being freight and labor. Mm -hmm. and, uh, okay, and we looked at it on a uh, buy order basic, basically. basically. Mm -hmm. uh, from there, okay, you can look for, are there any, uh, I would say, group of vendors or vendors or product line, mm -hmm. okay, maybe differently. Uh, you spoke about distance, distance, good one. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. where you're coming from. okay, if you're coming from China, you don't want to ship a box by boat, okay, every week or something like that, you would rather have larger quantity, okay. Uh, so depending where it's coming from, okay, mm -hmm. slightly different. So again, okay, when you're identifying your subgroups, mm -hmm. you have to take into account what are the main differences if you can lump them all in one or two or three, that's great, okay? Mm -hmm. If you can't, uh, the difficulty becomes that you have to go after these costs and it takes yeah. good modeling to be able to come up with something that is meaningful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and again, um, you know, we're not not trying to, to find the, the exact order cost by, by product. Um, it's, it's simply too much work and it's gonna be very inaccurate, uh, especially also if you're looking at slow or intermittent demand. Uh, so, you know, always try to lump it by a meaningful grouping for the cost you're looking at. So I think uh, sort of, you know, pr product line uh, where you're starting to divide them by, by product size, uh, large versus small. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, what is the location that I'm calculating these, these costs for? Is it remote or is it downtown? Um, is it suburb or downtown? Uh, and also what, what are the characteristics of the, the store or branch where you're selling this at? Uh, what is the art directional space space available? Um, so um, now we've we've talked a little bit about the the actual input parameters and uh, what what is a part of those input parameters and how do you diversify them across your uh, portfolio? I want to talk about the actual implementation of a NeoQ because uh, I think there's you know even even beyond these input parameters, there's there's lots and lots of sort of practical constraints um, that are really hard to model in the formula, but something that, uh, that are very important to get right, uh, trying to actually drive uh, adoption across your business. So we're gonna talk about a couple of constraints uh, that we see in practice. Um, so there's, there's different business rules that you might have to layer on top of your EOQ. So we have a, we have a very big list of, of practical constraints that we run into and I'll, I'll just put them on the slides here. And um, Pierre, I want to ask you like, so if we, we have these uh, constraints, you know, we have to think about seasonality, promotional demand, uh, intermittent demand, trends, uh, life cycles, MOQs, obsolescence, clustering, that, that's a lot of constraints. Um, what um, what do you do to actually sort of make sure they're all taken into account? Like, what, what is it you have to do to make sure that these are um, these are considered when when using EOQs? Yeah, if you look at my my favorite one, it's the one we always look at very very carefully. That's the supplier MOQ. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The that is that it, it will default if the EOQ is lower than the MOQ, and it could be just data issue, okay? You just mm -hmm. didn't the proper one, okay? Uh, the issue with this is that you're going to end up ordering much way more than you need. Mm -hmm. and 
thing with EOQ is that you're going to be able to identify that you're ordering way more than you need. Mm -hmm. and do something about it. So that's definitely one thing that we, we look carefully at. Obsolescence, I spoke about it because for mm -hmm. me, applying EOQ on everything is probably a mistake. On mm -hmm. a velocity item, you should really, really question yourself if you want to use EOQ there. Okay, because the velocity is low, but the obsolescence is high. Yeah. So I'm not sure that's where I'm going to make most of my gain, but uh, I can I can create art burns for the organization when I'm doing that. Yeah. Go ahead, uh, Danny, you wanted to say something? Oh, uh, no, I was, uh, I, was, I was still listening to you. Okay. Uh, trend and seasonality I spoke about. Okay, if you use mm -hmm. forecasting forecast as a base, okay, then you basically take care of those. Mm -hmm. uh, promotion, definitely, if it's not coming back year after year. Okay, you need to basically remove it from your forecast. But if you use forecasts and uh, you use the tools that you got properly, mm -hmm. you shouldn't be overly concerned about that. I, I think it also, uh, this kind of shows us, especially if you're looking at seasonality, the impact of promotions, intermittent demand trends and product life cycle, they, they're, all, they're all part of your um, SNOP or demand planning process. So if we want to use forecast, I think, you know, one of the enablers of EOQ is a good demand planning forecast, uh, demand planning process, um, because without a demand planning process, not having seasonality, not having your promotions removed from your baseline demand, um, not having your trends modeled, or maybe more importantly, not having your product lifecycle parameters uh, set up correctly. Uh, with the product lifecycle parameter being okay, we are we're uh, we're phasing out this product at the end of the year. Now, when you're calculating an EOQ, you don't want an EOQ that actually moves beyond that. So, if you don't cut off that forecast or, or remove that forecast uh, properly, then you you run the danger of having an EOQ that takes the the inventory supply beyond the last uh, the last day. So, I think that you know. The, the enabler of the EOQ is a good demand planning process that you have to build before actually uh, practically implementing it. Otherwise, you run that, that risk of um, having a wrong, a wrong output. Um, and it could be very dangerous because that directly kind of ties back to your obsolescence. Uh, if you buy product beyond your uh, last sales date, then uh, obviously that's just going to sit there and you can throw it all away. Agree. Agree. Yeah, so um, I think another important one for our um, for adoption within the business, and we, we talked already about this quite briefly. Um, so if we're looking at the EOQ formula, it's actually quite an um, it's an insensitive result. And with that, saying that, what I what I mean is that if you look at the the total cost of ownership line in the the uh, EOQ graph, you'll see that it's it's relatively flat at the bottom. That means you can you can easily say, okay, maybe my EOQ is 761, and that's that's you know no doubt that that is the the lowest total cost of ownership. But if we look at the total cost of ownership of buying 760, that's not really gonna make a big difference for my organization. The change is, is rather um, minimal in terms of total cost of ownership and we're, we're getting closer to having a number that's that's a lot more practical so we, we've talked about uh rounding to uh, what we call logistical units so maybe pierre you want to explain um you know how we, we we practically set this up uh within in within sonopar um to make sure that the um i guess i guess really tying tying to the, to the logistics and warehousing team, so they have a, a meaningful quantity to uh, to work with. Um, do you, you want to, yeah, get, give us a, a background of, of uh, how this is done, what we need to actually achieve this? Yeah, um, I, I think you, you said it earlier. Uh, you don't want to end up with one pallet, three bucks, uh, three bag, and two units. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you said it doesn't make any sense. So. Yeah. Well, the way we're doing it, we're basically, okay, set the logistical unit, okay, being one bag, box, case, pallet, layer, and pallet, okay? And based on that, okay, you look at the band that is defined over here, 
okay, as being plus or minus 5%. And you say within that band, pick the IS pack within the logistical unit. Yeah. So, okay, in this specific case, okay, what you see is within the band, it would go pick a pallet. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what we want it to be. Yeah. Again, okay, where you need to exercise judgment. And that's, mm -hmm. that's funny because people are saying to me, yeah, but we're one shy of being to, I don't know, okay, if it would be okay, just a pallet layer, but you would be one shy. They're kind of saying, yeah, but okay, we're only one shy. So the system should recommend a pallet. Yeah. The issue with a computer is that it's binary. Okay. Yeah. Well, either you build very sophisticated logic, mm -hmm. okay, either you use your judgment and you see that as a recommendation. Yeah. Okay, so for me, that's the whole idea. In the system today, we kept the logic simple. Mm -hmm. We need to exercise judgment at times. And I'm saying at times because it doesn't happen often. But mm -hmm. whenever it happens, if you're one away, okay, you say just order a pallet, mm -hmm. you have to order a pallet layer when, okay, uh, if it, there would be a very, very small difference, the system would have recommended a pallet. Yeah. But no, that would be 99% of the time, mm -hmm. you just let the system work for you. Mm -hmm. If you set up your logistical unit properly, it's gonna give you the right answer. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, we both seen this in practice, and I think many of the attendees as well, you run an EOQ formula and uh, suddenly you're, um, you're picking a quantity that just doesn't make sense. And uh, there's, there's no amount of convincing of how correct your formula is uh, with the people that are, are working in the warehouse. And I think for good reasons. So having a, a practical rounding that, that's meaningful, uh, but still gives you a relatively low uh, total cost of ownership is, is extremely beneficial for, our, for any company because it will uh, increase the adoption across your business, but significantly. There's no doubt about that. Um, I think furthermore, we, we have really one more thing that, that's truly important in EOQs and that's um, quantity uh, discounts or price breaks. Um, uh, what you often see is companies in companies that they they get a cheaper price if they buy more um and i think that's you know we often get the question okay uh, should i actually be going with that higher price or uh, lower price uh, but now i'll be buying a lot more and that's always a, an interesting question right um and actually the eoq this is this is something that that belongs entirely within the EOQ formula, because it, it's actually designed to, to answer this question for you. Um, so if we have a price discount, that means that actually our, our cost curve or our total cost curve is gonna be changing. So if we have the first discount or maybe a second discount at a certain amount, that means that our, our economic order quantity changes as well. And the question is, is it a good idea or not? And if you manage to model that in your, your EOQ formula, you, you actually get a really good uh, good output and you you answer that question for your business. So Pierre, um, within Sonopar or any other projects that you, you run, um, how, how important has it been to model these, these price breaks? Um, yeah, to be very honest, we still have some issues modeling it, mm -hmm. but it's a good idea, okay? And we definitely want to do it because we want the system to work. We, want, we don't want a second guess. Mm -hmm. It would be a good deal or not to move to the next quantity. Yeah. Okay, but we had some system issue in terms of uploading from uh, from the ERP to Slim Slim Stock Slim Four. Okay, so it's not being used, but uh, it it has to in in the perspective of optimizing. Mm -hmm. We're yeah. keep just looking for ways to do it. This always takes. I, I think for any company, it shouldn't be. The the first priority to, to get this in because I, I think it's a heavy master data exercise to get uh, the price breaks in correctly. Um, and there's a lot of different types of discounts uh, being a percentage discounts, new prices, uh, different sort of ranges, uh, contracts associated with that. So it's, it's, a, it's a big master data exercise, uh, but it, it can drive tremendous value because it, it straight away answers that question at, at the SKU level, should I be, Taking this discount, yes or no, uh, and it's it's entirely what what the EOQ was was designed to do. Now, um, Pierre, want to you know we're we're approaching the end of our our webinar, um, so I want to 
go with you through some of the the key takeaways um i think that we can uh, send everyone home with um so you know what 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 do you think if we're um implementing the eoq what what should we be really get get started with and what what are the lessons learned that we've uh, gone through today yeah i would say you should start with a big average okay like most are doing mm -hmm. uh, but you need to realize that you'll be far from being optimal if you do that mm -hmm. yeah and you probably have some people phoning you to let you know that it doesn't make sense and they're probably right so uh, realizing that you should probably create subgroups Okay, based mm -hmm. on your own reality, uh, will definitely make EOQ work better for you. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, we said the K okay, using forecasted sales. I think it's better than looking backwards for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially if you've got your demand planning process. Um, that, that, that's the thing. Okay, we have to assume there that uh, mm -hmm. you have good forecasting practices and mm -hmm. that your forecast accuracy is quite good. But assuming you do, definitely, okay, forecasted sales would be way better. Mm -hmm. uh, grouping, we spoke about, okay, it could be storage side, product size, uh, geography, okay. Uh, it's worth looking at groupings. But again, you have to be super cautious about not going overboard. So I remember I had a conversation with uh, one of the individual responsible. And they said at the branch level, it's not the same as the, the CDC in terms of setting, but we should maybe have small branches, medium branches and large branches. Okay, and that's the whole idea. Okay, within uh, Center Park Canada, we must have, I don't know, probably around a hundred branches. Mm -hmm. We don't want to end up with each branches having their own setting. You yeah. Know, groups, but, but meaningful groups. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think there's definitely an exercise to be done Okay, to say, okay, where does it make sense? Where doesn't it make sense? Where should we adjust the setting? Yeah, I, I like how you say that meaningful groups. Um, I think that's that's really a good starting point. Uh, meaningful being, you know, a group, um, grouping together products or branches that, that would probably have differences compared to other product groups or, or branches within within your network. And if you group those together, you can um, you can stick with one number within that group, uh, but you, you do have to discriminate the the, the holding order costs um, a little bit. Um, and then I think the last one, because we haven't talked about that during our, our webinar, but I, I think this is one, um, this is a classic use and typically the first use we, we see and practice when implementing an EOQ are uh, using the EOQ as a tool in supplier negotiations. Um, what sort of, how have you seen this applied in practice? But I, I think it's easy to apply it, okay? Mm -hmm. MOQ is almost taken as a given. Yeah. But mm -hmm. if you can show that it doesn't make sense, okay, to, mm -hmm. the, to the vendor, Okay, and you can explain why it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm looking on some item okay, that would be low velocity that creates some obsolescence issue over time if you apply it as is. Uh, in this case, you say my EOQ is already too high and my MOQ is larger than my EOQ. Mm -hmm. So it gives you some ammunition to go back to the vendor and to say, okay, I understand okay, that this is the minimum, but it doesn't make sense for me in my environment. Yeah. Okay, and it's more than just arguing because you can show the facts and the fact are that on these lines, okay, with those level of inventory created by the MOQ, mm -hmm. okay, uh, you're far from being optimal. Yeah, yeah, no, very, very true. Um, giving and driving that insight that the, the minimum order quantity might not make sense for your business can, can really help you uh, set the stage with your vendors. Mm -hmm. um, and in that case, you know, you can you can start with a simple EOQ because it, you know, because of the cost insensitivity that we talked about earlier. Um, just having that comparison and looking at the percentage difference, you start with the biggest differences, and and you probably get get some pretty good results already, uh, and that can help you in supplier or vendor negotiations uh, because the closer they are to the economic order quantity with their MOQs, 
uh, the better it could potentially be for you. Um, so this was um, the uh, the end of our, our content for uh, for today's webinar. Uh, we've got we got about fifteen minutes for uh, a Q and A session, and I see there's there's already been a lot of questions from the attendees. Um, so I'm going to take some time to to ask some questions from them. And uh, Pierre, if you um, could you know attempt the first answer um, as we're as we're going through them. Um, so we have a question from someone anonymous uh, with two questions. So um, the first one is in retail, we have a concept of an open to buy plan, uh, which is connected to the assortment planning and the retailer uses for replenishing uh, monthly POs. How do you correlate an open to buy plan with an economic order quantity? That's an interesting question. So we have an open supply. So we, we are limited by a certain cost that we, we still have to buy. How can we tie the economic order quantity into that? Do you think there's any, I think we want to cap the EOQ now in that case to make sure it doesn't go beyond that. Uh, in fact, you, you could calculate it. If you're, if you're tied with so many per month, Okay, and it's once a month. I don't, I'm not sure I'm grasping okay, what the question is, but then the OQ will just highlight to you that mm -hmm. maybe if the answer it doesn't make sense. But, uh, okay, EOQ is based on the, uh, okay, the, the, the best quantity you could buy if you're forced to buy a different quantity and mm -hmm. it's, it's happening with the MOQ. Mm -hmm. okay. If you would say buy 200, the MOQ is minimum 1,000. So obviously, okay, you're not optimal. Mm -hmm. No, you're not optimal and you know what the right number is, then you can see if you can do something about it. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's a hard question to answer, but yeah, it, it could be very restricted on economic order quantities. So I, um, I agree with that. Um, we have another question from uh, Adek Benga. Um, how do we mathematically calculate the holding cost without any assumptions? Um, you go what's, your, your, what's your advice here, Pierre? You no, know, you go through your financials. Go through your financials, yeah. No, that's what I think as well. Yeah. Yeah. So your freight in there, you have your labor costs and you have to segregate the labor costs which are linked to placing an order, receiving an order. Mm -hmm. Normally, okay, if you use your financial, we have templates that we've been using. Okay, so that's where you capture your obsolescence and okay, you just have to go through your financials and you're gonna be able, you're gonna be able to get the number. After that, when you go through subgroups, you may have to do some assumptions if you don't have enough detail in your financials. Mm. Yeah, I don't think you'll you'll entirely escape assumptions um, because because otherwise uh, you know, you're going to have to be, you know, going four decimals behind a comma, as you said earlier. Uh, and I think you're grouping, you're, you're taking certain assumptions, but, you know, as long as they're valid and, and meaningful assumptions, that, that could still help you. But yeah, you always start with um, the, the finance team typically has a lot of this data available already, and they, they could probably help you, uh, which also shows this is an interdepartmental effort to, to get that EOQ going and not just the supply planning uh, team. If you look at what we did, okay, we had operation people and we had financial people. And it's basically through the conversation that we come up with, with the right numbers. But the yes, I would say, especially when you start doing subgroup, there are some assumptions that you have to make because your financials are not detailed enough to be able to do that. No. Okay, they're not at the skew level. Mm -hmm. It would be nice, but they're not. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's true. Um, so, Another question from uh, who um, is the hauling cost equivalent to inventory cost? And what if the purchase price and cost per product can vary depending on the contract or sales season? That's actually interesting. What if the pricing develops differently over time? I'll run it by me again. I'm not sure I'm linking pricing. Yeah. So, um, you know, we have. Um, uh, I think the first question is, you know, is the holding cost uh, yeah. equivalent to the inventory cost, um, by which I think um, is meant, um, 
is it just the cost of holding inventory? Um, I think we can refer that back a few slides. Uh, so we'll, we'll send you, I think our slide deck is going out uh, as part of this, this webinar and uh, you can go through all the, the costs that go into the, um, the holding cost. Um, but what if the, the purchasing price and the, the, the cost per product can vary depending on contracts? So we definitely, we have different purchase prices based on different contracts. You do, okay, but we're not, we're not doing that. <laughs> no, I, I understand, but um, replacement cost. It, it is something we see, right? Uh, and have seen in yeah. the past. Um, uh, and that's, I think, where, you know, we have to move beyond, uh, you know, go, going behind the comma. We, we probably want to use our, our, uh, our most common buying price, just our standard price that we have. Then we're using our replacement cost, which is an average cost. Yeah, and, and typically if you have a contract, it's meant for a specific project anyway. Um, so that could be, you know, that you're, you're buying that entire, entirely outside your, your regular stock holding process. And, and in that case, the, the EOQ doesn't really apply. Great, yeah. Um, so let's go through another couple of questions. Someone asks what the uh, the difference between EOQ and just in time is. Um, I would say that's a that's a pretty big difference. Um, just in time is a concept of always getting your your inventory right when you need it. So I, I think it's entirely the, the opposite of economic order quantities because economic order quantities always assume that you uh, you are actually keeping inventory on hand. And in a just-in-time environment, you do not, uh, leading to very high ordering uh, costs, but very low holding costs. Um, so um, you could you could potentially uh, use the EOQ to, to calculate whether just-in-time is, is worth it. Um, but a question from uh, Azar. Um, can you give an example of grouping in a retail setup? So what sort of meaningful groupings could you make in a retail environment? Good size. Size, yeah. Size, okay. If you have bolts and you have, I don't know, uh, okay, something that is large. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, and I think what what um, it, it's somehow you know if we're it depends on what sort of retail we're looking at, but if we're looking at grocery stores, um, I think you know if you're looking at fresh produce, that's definitely a different grouping than uh, you would have for your products that that have much longer shelf lives. Um, especially if we want to make, you know, obsolescence and depreciation such a big component of, of how we calculate EOQs. Uh, but also for your um, replenishment, because you, you need, you know, do you need refrigerated trucks or regular trucks? Um, and then there's, there's I guess, you know, uh, the, the big stores versus small stores, uh, downtown versus remotes. Um, you're, you're seeing a lot of different groupings there. So that's definitely something I would be uh, starting with when you're looking at retail. Um, but yeah, it depends on what type of retail um, you're, you're active in. Um, I have a question from Mahmoud. Um, how can we assign non-capital cost for each product if we deal for a lot of products? So how can we calculate our non-capital cost if we deal with a lot of products? So let me just take it back to the slides that we were talking about our holding costs. So oh, lots of slides. There we go. So Pierre, I think this sort of ties into, you know, you, you mentioned that earlier finance doesn't necessarily work at the, the SKU level. Um, so maybe what sort of assumptions do you take when assigning uh, labor or, or rent to uh, a, a product group or... Uh... But again, okay, it's about grouping. Okay, if you look at, okay, in one of our warehouse, we have a robot, okay, or an ASRS, and we do have uh, pallet storage. So what you're going to see is in terms of size, okay, one capture much less than the other one. So that's mm -hmm. what you would use. When you look at the rent, the rent is by square footage. Mm -hmm. okay, which one is consuming the most? Mm -hmm. So you can adjust. Uh, as I said earlier, okay, you have to adjust for obsolescence. This product, okay, mm -hmm. that are more prone to obsolescence. Yeah. 
But again, okay, we have, and you know that Danny, we have mm -hmm. a great shop called 200, 250,000 skull. Mm -hmm. You may end up with 10, 12 grouping. Yeah. So the whole idea is to do groupings. Yeah. That's our, I think, you know, meaningful uh, product size groupings also makes sense. Uh, you know, if you know the total cost of a, a warehouse uh, or the rent, uh, you can simply look, you know, what is the, this, the, the cubic uh, meters or cubic foot that I have available. Uh, look at the cubic foot or cubic meters of, of products and uh, assign, you know, the, 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 the cost per, per, per uh, cubic feet to that product, uh, depending on its size. So you, it's, it's actually, uh, it can be pretty straightforward uh, to, to do that. And it shouldn't, doesn't have to be complicated at all um, when you're trying to set this up. So um, I think we're, uh, we're at the end of our um, time today. And I would like to, first of all, of course, uh, Pierre, thanks for your time and uh, very valuable insights. Uh, it was a pleasure talking to you today. Uh, I wanna thank Supply Chain Canada for putting this together. And I wanna thank all our uh, attendees today for their uh, really good questions. And uh, of course, their attention during uh, this, this uh, webinar. Um, if you have any questions, uh, do not hesitate to contact me or Pierre. Um, as part of this uh, webinar, we'll be, we'll be sharing the slide deck with our contact details. Uh, so you should be expecting that pretty soon. And thank you, Simona, for, uh, for hosting us today. Thanks so much, Danny. Thank you, Pierre. Uh, if anyone has uh, any questions for the speakers, feel free to get in touch with me or uh, with them through their contact information, which will be shared and we will share as well slides and, and uh, recordings. So thanks everyone and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone.